I'd like to introduce Darren LaCroix. Um, better stories, better business. Please close your eyes for a moment. Think of your favorite Hollywood movie. What is the most memorable scene in that movie? The most memorable moment in that scene? Can you clearly see that image? Okay, open your eyes. Hollywood movies are memorable. Your stories can become me more memorable with secrets from film. Craig Valentine says, if you want to get $10,000 for a speech, you need to tell $10,000 worth of stories. Stories are the heart of speaking. They are also key to connecting with the hearts of your audience. Darren bombed miserably in comedy in Boston in 1992. Seven years later, he, spoke, he outspoke 25,000 contestants to become the world champion of public speaking, something I will never be. The key to this transformation was telling better stories. Your storytelling coach for today, the 2001 world champion of public speaking, Darren LaCroix. Let's go back, to Aunt, let's go back now to Anaheim, California, where they are, are about to announce the winner. After four years of business school, I went out and I went for the American dream. I bought a Subway sandwich shop. <laughs> oh, yeah. You're all impressed, I can tell. I don't want to brag or anything, but in six short months, I took a $60,000 debt, and I doubled that debt. <laughs> And the 2001 world champion of public speaking, Darren LaCroix. That's cool. <laughs> Did anyone else ever cry during this thing? Am I the first one? <laughs> Does that count as a gesture? <laughs> I'll never forget. My dad probably doesn't even remember. He said, I don't care what you want to do. Just be the best. And I am, Dad. That carry. And wanting to help people comes through in everything he does. Darren cares about you. I think you get the full package with Darren. He's a, he's a mentor. Someone just said you're going to be you're the world champion. What are you going to do now? I'm going to Disneyland. <laughs> So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Darren. Thank you. Oops. That's why she's here. Making it happen. Thank you. D rule number one. Duh. Did I mention I am far from perfect? But so do you think still Ian Dion needs a video introduction? One of the greatest performers 
I live in Vegas. I love studying Vegas headliners. The only way I could get my sister to visit me in Vegas, because she hates Vegas, was to get her tickets to see Celine. So there we are. My sister and I were in the, uh, up in the balcony. We're watching. And before Celine comes out, a video pops up. And you see Celine at the beginning of her career. Huh. Your brain thinks, wow, she's been doing this a long time. Then all of a sudden you see images of her kids and you think, wow, that's right, she's a mom too. And then they showed images of her and her adoring husband and you think, wow, that's right, she's a wife too. So before Celine even comes out on the stage, you feel one step closer. Why? Because you saw her story. You realize there's more than just this amazing voice up there. There's a woman, there's a wife, there's a mom. So lesson number one, when I study Vegas headliners, I realize they, they, everything, everything is strategic in order to create that connection with the audience. So I said, how can I do that? But my lesson for you is, how can you do that? Before you set up a conversation, do they know you? Is there a story you could use before the conversation to set the frame, to frame it? So I say you must connect before you can educate, entertain, or inspire. You must connect first. Lesson one, you must connect first. So do you feel a little closer connection to me now because of that video? I thank you. I hope so. That is my point. That is my strategy. You know, not a lot of guys brag about crying. <laughs> but I know it's important to create the connection because if I'm here to do what I'm supposed to do, I need to create that connection. So, a few facts about that. That was in 2001. I was 35 years old. At that time, I had been a speaker and a stand, uh, did stand-up comedy for a while, a speaker, stand-up. And I had been struggling for seven years. I still had a day job on that day the day before. Uh, I wondered if my effort would ever pay off. My friends told me I was crazy, I was stupid, that's not for you. I worked at Bose Corporation, the stereo speaker company. This is a newspaper article about they did about employees. So you know the Bose Wave Radio, that was my job as I pursued this dream of what I get to do now and stand up. So. Juggling your dream and day jobs. That's me in the little circle there, a little telemarketing headset, smiling and dialing so I could pursue that dream. And some of you might remember the old Chris Farley Saturday Night Live skit, the motivational speaker. I remember that. I lived in a van down by the river. I didn't even have the van. Those of you younger, Google it. Put it on, check out YouTube. It's hysterical. Uh, and this was a story that kept me going. I started stand-up in 92. This came out in 1993. Any Rudy fans here? Rudy, Rudy. That was a story I clung to because he was dyslexic. I was dyslexic. See, the stories, the power of them is the relating and the emotion. And I'm going to show you what I took 20 years to learn from my coaches. But that was the character that kept me going when everybody around me told me I was crazy, I was stupid, that's not for you. That's just not your lane. You went to business school. You should get a job in a, shut up. Anyway, so where did the story begin? Well, you heard the subway joke. That is a true story. Uh, I went for the American dream, opened a subway shop. I was going to own multi-stores. I was going to be a multi-store owner. It was just coming to central Massachusetts where I lived at the time. So it was just, I was on the wave, I was on the cusp. Uh, that was the first one, that was day one. I was very excited, the sign hadn't even come in yet. And about a year and a half later, they opened another subway right down the road from me. Took all my profits off the top. I had to get the job at Bose to pay my employees so I didn't default on my loans. I needed that, I needed to grow up, I needed to take responsibility. About a year and a half later, I sold it at a loss, and I was thrilled. <laughs> I was thrilled. But my buddy, 
my buddy, uh, because I was so down and depressed, hand me this motivational tape of this man named Brian Tracy. And I'm driving down the road, driving to Bose, and while I'm driving, he asked a question. He said, what would you dare to dream if you knew you wouldn't fail? If I wouldn't fail, what? I'd be a comedian, how cool would that be? Make people laugh and earn a living at that? And then all of a sudden the doubting voice on your head, uh, on my shoulder said, but you're not funny. True, but that wasn't the question. The question was, what would you dare to dream if you knew you wouldn't fail? So what would you dare to dream if you knew you wouldn't fail? At that point, I was at such a low point. I said, you know what? I have to try this just once. It's crazy, but what if that guy is right? I'm not funny. I get it, but what if he was right? What if I could? So I was pumping myself with motivational tapes, and uh, I just said, you know what, when I told my friends and family, they compared me to Jerry Seinfeld, someone just thinking about it to someone at the top of their profession. That's not fair. But it's human nature. I get it. So I said, I need to go and ask somebody who is where I want to be. One of the cool things about this conference is you're around people who do what you do, have the problems you have, and have solved them. Cool. That's why the conversations in the hallway may be even more powerful than what you hear up front of the room. That's the important part, the extra important part. So I decided I would go to a comedy club. Never been in a comedy club in my life. So I go to this little comedy club in Worcester, Massachusetts. Dick Doherty's Comedy Hut. I walk in. I'm a shy, quiet introvert. I have no business being in there. I had to work up the courage to walk in the door. Uh, at the end of the show, I walk up to this guy. His name is Chris McGuire. He's still a writer in Hollywood. I would worked up all the courage I could. I said, hi, my name is Darren. I want to try this. What do I need to do? And he asked me a question. He said, are you funny? I said, no. <laughs> he said, good. Good? What do you mean good? He went on to explain that people who are class clowns, he said, that's one skill set. He said, but people who are in front of an audience, a group of strangers, that's a different skill set. But that skill set can be learned. Ooh. What? I pulled a Scooby-Doo. He said two things. Number one, you got to get the book. I'm like, there's a book about stand-up comedy? Well, of course, there's books about everything, but I wasn't looking for it. I didn't even, wasn't on my radar screen. He said, number two, you need to go to open mic nights and watch other people who are just starting out. Well, duh. Now I'm comparing myself to someone else who's starting out rather than Jerry Seinfeld. That makes sense. So on Sunday night, I went to this little comedy club called Stitches right outside of Fenway Park in Boston. I walked in. I could smell the stale beer. I could feel the sticky floor. I was like, this is cool. I watched people go up for their first time. They sucked. And I thought, I could do that. I could be that bad. It inspired me. I was so pumped. I went and I got the book. I studied. I went to Stitches every Sunday night for two months. I did the exercises in the book. I, every night I got... I went to Stitches, I got inspired again. It was April 26, 1992, Stitches, Boston, Mass. Do you ever have a moment in your life where it turns into slow motion? I always remember the comedian introducing me that night. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage for the first time, Darren LaCroix. And I came up from this side of the stage. little jokes on note cards. I put them on the bar stool in front of me. I had so much anxiety going through my body, I didn't have the wherewithal to pull my hand off the note cards. You ever try and read while you're shaking? One of my first jokes was about Dr. Robert Goddard, who had launched the first Rick and Fuel rocket in history in my hometown. Goddard Space Centers are named after him. But the first flight only went 41 feet. And so I was making light of it. But I was so nervous that what I was saying, what I was doing with my body, were not in sync at all. And I said, the rocket took off, and it went vertically. This is horizontal, right? I know you guys had a late night. But I said one thing. I did the exact opposite. That instant, I realized 
what I did, and I just reacted. I said, ah, oh, shoot. It's not actually the word I used, but all of a sudden, everyone laughed. Why are you laughing? That's not where you're supposed to laugh, but I'll take it. That's the only laugh I got that night. As I walked off stage, this man put his arm around my shoulder. He's like, don't worry, man, it's, it's, it's okay, it's just your first time. And I remember thinking, don't worry, it's my first time? Do you see what I did? I got a laugh. I am the king of comedy. Why so often do other people tell us what success is? Everyone there that night thought I bombed. I looked at it differently. I got a laugh. Something worked. If I could get rid of everything else that didn't work and figure out how to reproduce it, I could do this. I've been doing speaking and stand-up ever since that night. Now, when I tell that story, a lot of people look at me and think, well, he's pretty comfortable up there. It couldn't have been that bad. Well, I brought proof. My friend's wife was there that night with a video camera. Now, before I show you this clip, let me get two things out of the way right up front. Number one, this was 1992. A lot has changed. And ladies, I am fully aware that parachute pants are no longer in fashion. <laughs> Check this out. Does anyone here live in New England? Yeah. yeah. I, had, I figured I had to get so you can see it. Uh, anybody ever notice that any, every other small town in New England takes one little small historical fact makes it the greatest event in the world. <laughs> Sorry for my voice, like, fluttering a little bit. But um, a lot of towns are like this. Um, I did, I, I was doing some research, like, places like Lexington, you know, the first um, revolutionary skirmish happened there. Um, what was his name? I can't even think of his name. Obviously, he was real famous. Eli Whitney was in Westboro, you know, born in Westboro. Um, I was doing some research and I discovered that the, the actual, the first dentist to use ether actually happened in Charlton, Massachusetts. And yes. an interesting thing about this <laughs> was he actually experimented himself. You know, nobody else had done this before. And, and he, he started with animals and then he used his own dog. <laughs> all right, that's all I can handle. <laughs> now tell me the truth. If you were there in that comedy club that night and you saw that performance, would you have ever walked up to me and said, you know, Darren, if you practice real hard, someday you could do this for a living? No. I don't know how I went up a second time. But my question for you is this. Whatever you choose to go for, if I can go from that to doing this for a living, what can you do? What can you do? We had John yesterday. Amazing story. He had something thrown at him. Life change. He made us all realize, oh, my problems aren't so bad. I chose this. If I can do it, I know you can. I know right now in life you got a challenge. Me too. My mom and dad aren't doing well. But we got to keep going. So here we are, back to the future. So you might have noticed that I've been around a couple of days. Who's this guy? I've never seen him before. I choose to come in early because I want to spend time with you. I want to get to know you so I can connect what I teach to, what, to your world. So this is cool. How about a round of applause for pre our president again, Kevin? <laughs> Thanks for having me here. We can make you a great public speaker if you choose to, but it's a choice. It's choice. Uh, the more important part down here, the support team, the past presidents. Uh, how about a round of applause for all of them? <laughs> Every year, different challenges. Uh, first timers, I know we just uh, we had you stand up. Another round of applause for the first timers. 
you, you had no idea what you were getting into, did you? You know, what is this? I, I kind of picture this as kind of like a big, you know, MA meeting, Membership Anonymous. Hi, my name is Darren, and I'm a memberaholic. <laughs> Somebody usually, you runs out of, hi, Darren, okay. Um, so thank you to Michael. Uh, I called a few people ahead of time and wanted to get to know ahead of time before I even got here what was going on. So thank you, Michael. Give Michael a round of applause, spending time with me on the phone. Uh, where's Armin? Oh my gosh, his story yesterday? Come on, give it up for Armin. All right, Tuesday, Monday, thank you. I had lunch with him, I spelled your name wrong, sorry about that. Um, I had lunch with him. I think his blood type is B positive. Seriously, spend some time with him. Like he, wow, that's awesome. Uh, and then how about, what do you guys think of this little thing? The tag, the key? They're different, right? I don't know about you, like, um, I would flash back to being in New England, growing up, snowstorms, and my mom would take my mittens and pin them to my sleeve. <laughs> so, but the only problem, they're very cool, the only problem is like I went to my door and I've got my, and I'm trying to like, <laughs> I don't know, maybe it's just me. Um, and how about our vendors, huh? serving you coffee, but here's what I love. I go to associations all the time. I always check out the vendor area, but here's what I love. When I talk to them, they love you because you love them. I think that's awesome. I think that says a lot about you, and that made me even happier to be here and happier to serve the people who serve. So one more time for the vendors. That's awesome. So cool. And then the toasters, can we talk about the toasters? <laughs> hey, it's just a reminder in life, you gotta slow down. <laughs> um, be grateful for the toast that you're about to get 10, 20 minutes down the road, but it's coming, it's coming. I couldn't figure out how to get the little light to go. I'm like, the light isn't going on. Anyway, I love this stuff. Anyone else have a challenge with the lights in the room? A couple of giggles, yeah, that's when, I, I did really good until last night. So for those of you who don't, didn't have trouble, like the main switch out front, like that has to be on in order for this one. And I'm, I'm there in a room by myself, I'm going back and forth. Like this, this is, I don't know. I almost had to call maintenance to shut my light off so I could go to sleep. Uh, and for the first time in 30 years, okay, I do convention and conference. I love what I get to do for a living. I love studying what I study and share. But for the first time ever, at a convention, at lunch, I observe someone pick up a fork. Yep, Kobe Hall. I thought that would have been funnier. I, 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 was, I was watching, where is he? There he is. Uh, I got to have lunch with Joe. Give it up for Joe. Joe, fist bump, boom. I was like, then I realized you're going through all the facilities. You can't help yourself. You're, you're like judging and looking at everything and like, oh, that's a good idea. Well, that's stupid. Um, yeah, so anyway, thank you, Joe Foster, for spending some time with me. Um, and then at lunch too, I asked, what's the biggest day-to-day -day frustration in running membership? And I won't say who, but this young guy just, the members. <laughs> I don't think he was supposed to say that, but, um, oh, we love them. I was like, yes, finally some honesty. Because I asked a lot of people, oh, no, no, there's no frustrations and no, I was like, you guys are, you, I understand the positive, yeah, okay. So, and then we had this guy. How about a round of applause for him? Wasn't that huge, flipping, awesome. Uh, Joe Leary, I've never met him in the speaking circuit before, but I got to spend some time with him. I'm gonna have him on my podcast. He's just amazing and got us all to remember our life ain't that bad. And yeah, I got it pretty good. So he reminded us to smile, got us to go deep. Um, 
And then also when I was at lunch, someone said, remember when John O'Leary was joking about the people who cry every day, crying every day at work? Uh, someone said, I know where they worked. <laughs> <laughs> That was funny. I won't say you said that, Joe. Thank you. Uh, so, and then is Frederick here? Frederick left. I thought that was the line of the conference. If you remember Frederick when he came up and got his prize, the selfie stick. Uh, I can't even say it or I'll get canceled, but uh, yeah, I thought that was hysterical. I went up and made sure I shook his hand, love and humor, uh, I had to do that. So, um, and by the way, if you're watching this replay, I don't know if you can zoom in or not, but, or if you're watching this replay and you have no idea what I'm talking about, you're watching the replays out of order. Go watch the other ones, but thanks. All right. So, um, and is Costa here? Costa's still here? So I guess he's not here. I just, I sat with him, and when we were talking about stories on the, on the first day, Monday, uh, I learned that he was a kid who always wanted to be someone. He said, when I was little, I always wanted to be someone. And he's from Albania. Uh, he spoke zero English when he came here to the United States. He started as a busboy. Here's what I love. He said that he remembers... This is part of his story, but I want you to see the influence that you have on every one of your employees, even if they don't seem like they're listening, even if they're ignoring you, they're listening. You don't know how deep you can go and what's going on, their problems in their lives right now. You can impact them. Here's what he was told by his first general manager. It doesn't matter that you can't speak English, work hard and one day you will become manager. That was a moment in his life, he never forgot that. And now he is a manager and has been. So I wanna remind you that even though, yeah, they work with you, they're, co they're people and they need you to be deep and real and love on them, even if they don't deserve it. I'm sure there's days, did you get that? Uh, and then, of course, our choir. How about that? Was that a moment or what? Freedom Road. Uh, that will not actually be the album cover, but it's going to be close. We're, we're... But that was just what a great experience. Uh, Beth, thanks for bringing them in. And I, when you guys were throwing out lines, I was like, this is actually pretty good. And then when he sang it. And of course, we, we were taught the, the, the Aussie adage, dare to suck, the inspirational quote for the day, the bumper sticker, next year's theme, by the way, right? No? Okay. <laughs> not, your, not your year, you're just, you're just. Uh, and then of course, I love this, I don't know if you caught it, but he said, it exists now, it didn't before. Understand how deep that is, it exists now, but it didn't before, the song. But every moment that you have, the stories that you're telling, the conversations that you have with your members and with your people, those conversations, maybe just a little deeper, because you can influence more than you realize. And you're planting some seeds that don't think look like they'll stick, but they might only be getting love from you, and they're not at home. Consider that. And then, of course, Dr. Jeff McGee, uh, rumor has it, uh, found out from TSA, that he did actually take a breath of air. <laughs> He's, he, yep, it, it happened. It was an accident. He tripped, but he did take a breath of air. Uh, I love Dr. Jeff. He's actually a, a colleague of mine from Las Vegas, so we were, it's cool to share the stage, but... Um, anyway, he's awesome. And then we had Dr. Sparks. Do uh, you remember his transparent story when he talked about the, with his professor? Did that make you feel a little more connected with him? That's the power of story. We love stories. I want to show you how to use it more strategically in business and make them stickier so you can have more influence in less time. So... Sorry, camera. <laughs> do, do you feel, now that you, 
how do you feel now that you saw that I spent the time with you and we recapped a little? Do you feel a little closer? I thank you. And, and I do that because A, I care, B, it's just who I am, but I wanna remind you too that I came and listened first. If you listen to other people's stories first, they're going to be more likely to let you influence them. If you listen to people's stories first, they'll be more open to let you listen to them. All right. Do you want to speak or do you want to be heard? Do you want to speak or be heard? It's about influence. More influence. Ask and listen first. Listen to their story first. When I did some of my recon, I found out some of the challenges that you have. Hiring quality people, high turnover rates, and keeping members happy. All right, so how do we use stories to help us with this? What if stories could be a more powerful tool? Maybe you just have stories, use them at certain times, but let's be a little more strategic. Stories are not just for wine dinners anymore. If you have wine dinners, uh, one of, when I had a conversation with someone and they told me that you know, they have a story for each bottle of wine and the, the better story sells more wine. Why not use that elsewhere when you're trying to sell somebody on a point, when you're trying to get a member to see something they don't want to see or understand? All right, so in the next 97 minutes, we're going to take a look at your stories. Uh, you're never going to look at stories the same way again, guaranteed. I like to make up words, guaranteed. So we're gonna take a break, about 10-ish, so you can get one more ounce, one more dose of coffee and uh, talk to the vendors one more time, but that's the plan. So I've done this same workshop for Liz. Liz runs a place called Safe, Fest, uh, Safe Nest in Las Vegas for kids um, and women who are abused. And she went through the same thing you're gonna go through. She said, we raised more money in history at our event than ever, particularly in the ask, you know, they're asking for money, they're asking for donations, which is a place she had a story that had the most significant impact. You appreciate your help with the story. So she already had a story. I just showed her how we could tell it better. And she said it got more emotional impact and raised more money. Uh, this is a million dollar speaker. Her name is Michelle Villanobis. And she's, uh, we worked with her on her story and she loved it. She said it made it way more effective. She was already a million dollar speaker. So are your conversations in marketing memorable? Ooh. Or are they perishable? Single guy, I didn't. I had the fruit out at home. I didn't put it away. I got home from a trip. I was like, oh, my first reaction, my second reaction was, oh. Here's why. I'm going to teach you about story that it's the emotion of the story that makes the difference. This picture, this image, I'm a germaphobe, this image elicited emotion with me. Things that elicit emotion with you are gonna help you tell stories. All right, do they remember you three days later? Um, do you remember Rosella the Teller? Rosella the Teller, you remember her for two days ago, right? Two days ago, you heard a story in a speech. Here's my bigger question. What are your thoughts about the bank, anyone? Whether you're familiar with Sovereign Bank, but what, what were your thoughts about the bank after you heard that story. Good place to work. People care, good culture. <laughs> What's that? Good place to bank. Trust. But it was just a story. That's my point. This little story that he told, great story, Change your thoughts, change your perspective about the bank. What if you could change members' perspective about some of their challenges? That's one of the powers of story. That was two days ago you heard that. If you went to the bank and you had a bad experience, would you now be more likely to give them a second chance because you heard that story? Yeah. So it gives you a buffer as well. How cool is that? That's powerful. Um, can simple stories change a big company? I don't know if I would have believed it years ago. Now I get it. Um, Howard White was a VP at Nike. He's a real, he's a storyteller. He takes his time. He's uh, just this brilliant storyteller and brilliant VP at Nike. 
Founder uh, Phil Knight, if you don't know, he is like type A, like you gotta get it done, you da 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 da, like make it happen. So one day, Howard White walks in Phil Knight's office and says, what if we took the Air Jordan shoe and turned it into a brand? What are you talking about? Like, we, we, this is Phil's reaction. Like, what are you talking about? We, we can't make it a, he's, when he's active, because Nike's policy at that time was they only have brands, uh, they only have shoes based on people who are actively playing. So Howard says, you know, this morning I drove up to Nike campus. I came to a stoplight. I stopped. I was right behind a car. And of course, Phil's like, hey, I get to the point, get to the point. <laughs> Light turned green. Car drove away. Mercedes Benz good car yeah 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 then he said Carl Benz has been gone for a hundred years and the Jordan brand took shape a simple story about a stoplight a car at a stoplight changed Nike now, you still need the numbers. You still need the other part, too. But this was the shift that changed Nike and turned Air Jordan shoe into Air Jordan brand. That's big. And then here's what he says about storytelling. So when, we short, short, when we story tell, it's our ability to connect with the audience and bring them into a shared experience. When we learned about Rosella, you had a shared experience. When you do this back at your club, when you tell stories, whether it's with members or with teams, or at home, when you create the time to take the story, it's a shared experience. So one of my challenges when I teach corporate presenters, I know that's not what you do, but when I teach corporate presenters, one of my problems is getting them to understand the power of story because they're all slide, 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 and they're boring slides too. Um, if you haven't read the book Made to Stick, 63% uh, of listeners remember stories, 5% remember statistics. And I'm not saying don't use statistics. I'm taking this important statistic and wrap it in a story so we remember it. Uh, my buddy Ed Tate says, our job as presenters is to turn numbers back into people. So how do I get people to see the power of story who give corporate presentations and they're just case studies and numbers and facts and numbers and facts and graphs? So. Remember, 31.25% of presenters make up statistics on the spot anyway. <laughs> Thank you for staying with me. I appreciate that. Uh, so I fly to Nashville. I have a big conference in Nashville. I fly there. I got a speech the night before. Excuse me. I, I traveled all day and a speech the next day. And I get to my hotel room, and it's freezing, and it's 90 degrees on the thermostat. So I jack it up as much as I can. It's still blowing out cold here. It's freezing. It's 11 o'clock at night. I traveled all day. I'm dead tired. I know if I call the maintenance guy, it's probably going to take a while for him to get there, so I'm going to stay up even later. So what would you do? Would you suck it up, buttercup, go under the sheets uh, and get as warm as you can, find an extra blanket, or would you call down and wait? What would you do? A little bit of both. So I grabbed my Patriots. Sorry. Patriots fan. Uh, grab my Patriots hat. My brother used to fly for the Dolphins. Anyway, um, <laughs> grab my Patriots hat, get under the covers, and suck it up, buttercup. Next morning, I put my hand out, grab the phone, and because I hate to be cold, that's why I live in Vegas, and then call down. A couple minutes later, this guy shows up. His name is Gerald. Gerald came to fix it. I documented this because I was like, this could be a story. This could be a story. Uh, Gerald came to fix it. Gerald's smiling ear to ear. You couldn't help but like him. And he's sitting there, walks in the door, and he's got a plunger in his hand. <laughs> he immediately goes right into the bathroom, which is right there. And I was like, Gerald, Gerald, Gerald. And he pops his head back out. Yes, Mr. LaCroix. I said, I, the AC, it's blowing AC. I, I need heat. Oh, Sorry takes his plunger, goes back to his uh, maintenance room, gets his stuff, gets his belt, comes back, 
and then unscrews the AC unit in the side. Two minutes later, it's working. What's my point? See, in story and business and strategy, we got to have the point. The story is designed to deliver the point. Um, are you using a plunger to heat, fix the heating unit? What I'm saying is you're trying to get buy-in. You're trying to persuade people, influence people with only numbers and slides, and they're missing stories. Simple little thing that happened at a hotel. Relatable. Relatability is important as well in stories. So what if you could use this tool to have more influence? Uh, so we're going to use a handout there if you want to follow along. David Brooks, uh, friend, mentor, world champion, he said, we all have different stories, but we share the same six emotions. See, it is the emotion we check in, connect on. That's why right after the opening video, I stop and I ask you, what did you feel? It's that emotion. And these are the six, if you want to jot them down, if you want to take notes. So happiness, sadness, anger, fear, surprise, and disgust. There are many more emotions, but they're all offshoots of these. Happiness, sadness, anger, fear, surprise, and disgust. Happiness, sadness, anger, fear, surprise, and disgust. So here's the key. If we can connect with a story, what's the emotion of the story? That's one thing that people never ask when they're creating or telling a story. What's the emotion? Does the emotion shift? The quickest way to connect with anyone is to share your failures, your flaws, and your first. That's what we were saying yesterday uh, when they were talking, uh, excuse me, Monday, when the guys um, and Mr. Farber were talking about your story. He had you, he had the little sheet there and had you go through the story of your life. And have you told that story to some of your employees because they just look at you as the boss. I want to get them to hear your story so they see you as a person, not just the boss. So uh, Sherwin Greenblatt, he's the first employee of Bose Corporation. When I first started at Bose, they brought us down to this little uh, meeting room and Amar walks in and Amar is the guy that Dr. Bose number one employee. And he tells us the story and he shows us this picture of Bose Corporation, it's this big corporate logo, black and white pictures, younger people, black and white, um, Google it. Um, so he shows us this picture, this like corporate, and like all these cars around it, and he tells us, he said, here's a story behind that picture. When we first started, it was just Dr. Bose and me. We had this building, but we had no employees. It was just us two. We actually had to walk around the office park and ask people if they would come over and move their cars in front of the office building so we could take this picture. It was a cool story, but it, it helped me see their humble beginnings. And by the time I left the meeting, I wanted to work harder for them. That's why I want you to tell your stories so people want to work harder for you, but not just because it's their job, it's because they care. Because now they know who you are. They know you more deeply. So Craig Valentine, uh, one of my buddies, he said, look, when you're trying to influence, understand there's a percentage of your audience who will never, ever buy into what you're saying. Let it go. It ain't going to work. There's going to be a percentage who buy in no matter what. They're ready. They need to hear it. The reason these ideas, these techniques I'm showing you is so that you can influence if you're more compelling for everybody on the fence. That's the reason we're doing this. Okay, so why? Have you ever had a child just before bedtime say, Mommy, Daddy, show me a PowerPoint presentation? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> no, it's tell me a story. So from childhood, our brains are, are conditioned to love stories. We want to we want to know stories. We want to hear stories. So if there's a communication method that people are open to, to listen to, why not use it? That's what we're talking about. So number one, people love stories. Uh, they can change perspective. We just talked about that with Nike. That's a great example. Uh, we like being entertained. Yeah, we get these. These are no-brainers. Got it, but I need to list them. Um, they can bring life to your presentation and conversations. 
And here's my favorite, though. This is what you may not have considered. They reach the subconscious mind. That is what makes them stick. That is the power of them. That is why they're going to remember them longer. So, again, you have grooves in your brain that love stories. So why not use the grooves? Um, we must convince the jury in the audience's mind. You can't just tell somebody something. We have to convince the jury in the mind of the audience. So how do we get it there? If you think of the brain, you have the conscious mind. That's what we know. And then the subconscious mind. Subconscious mind, that's where your habits are. That's where you actually act on. So knowing it and doing it are very different. You know, if you think about January, January, you know, New Year's resolutions, we want to eat better, we want to eat, be healthier. And you walk into a restaurant on January 2nd and you see this beautiful chocolate cake and it's just glistening and you think, don't eat the cake, don't eat the cake, don't eat the cake. You turn around and on your way out, eat the cake. Because it hasn't changed in your subconscious mind. In your conscious mind, you're trying to convince yourself. You're trying to convince yourself. So how do we get it there? Uh, one way, of course, is repetition. Uh, the problem is we forget things. We forget 50% of what you hear today, you're going to forget tomorrow. Another 50% of after that and another 50% after that. By next week, you'll swear I was not even here. So if we forget so much, how do we get it to stick? Well, that's the subconscious mind. Repetition, repetition, repetition. That's why you hear things in commercials. That's why you have to tell people over and over again. That's why you get to tell your kids over and over again. But eventually, boom, it sticks. That is the aha. That's the goal, to plant the seed of the lesson learned, of the new perspective. I love this by Don Nacera, my one of my coaches. She said, the aha is the letting go of a previous belief. That's deep. An aha is the letting go of a previous belief. That's the goal here. The second way is a story well told. A story well told goes right into the subconscious. We don't forget that. And what is a story well told? I studied with this guy named Stanley Ralph Ross. He's one of the creators of the original Batman series, not the movies, but you remember the old pow, biff, bam? Uh, he wrote those, and he said, a story is an appealing protagonist in pursuit of a worthwhile goal against seemingly insurmountable obstacles. An appealing protagonist. We like the character, we can relate to the character. Worthwhile goal. There's good reason they're trying for that, they're striving for that. Seemingly insurmountable obstacles. Batman is tied to the piece of wood, go, about to go through the buzzsaw, and then what do they do? Go to commercial. <laughs> what would happen? That's the power of story. That's why they sell commercials. So this is not a religious statement, uh, but Jesus did not use PowerPoint. Whether you're a believer or not, we still kind of talk about him. But he used parables. Even it's biblical that he says, I will speak in parables. Well, not a bad idea. Why don't we do that more? Okay. In 2001, I entered the speech contest. I was trying, trying, trying. You heard the deal. But here's why. My other mentor said, Darren, stop trying to find that stories which will launch your career. Instead, take the stories you already have and make them so good someone will pay to hear them. What? I just thought I had to find a story. He said, no, no, you got to take it and you got to work with it. You got to massage, you got to add some things, you got to get rid of some things that are boring. All right, so in 2001, I joined the speech contest to force myself. So in my world, a keynote speaker, uh, I have this speech, and let's just say the value of it is a five out of 10. So it's five out of 10. So my reason for joining the speech contest, it's only seven minute speech contest, was to pull out a story I was already telling and force myself to work on it, work on it, work on it, to make it better, to then put it back in the, val in the keynote, raising the value of the whole keynote. So my buddy Craig says, if you want to master peace, you have to master the pieces. So I joined the contest just to work on that story, to make my career, to be paid for what I wanted to do. So this is the speech, uh, and a couple years ago I was in Taiwan, I'm on a high-speed train going from uh, northern Taiwan to southern Taiwan, and I'm giving two speeches, and this is the district leader, uh, this was for a Toastmasters event, she was a district leader, her name is Therese, and we're driving in the train, and she goes, Darren, 
When uh, you were here six years ago, I was not a Toastmaster. I was in a, you were doing a workshop for my company. I was just a guest. She said, you told that story of your first time on stage and how nervous you were. Remember when I told you that? Six years later, she's telling me in a train and she does this. Because she remembered it. Because it went into her subconscious mind. She said that I got her to join Toastmasters and then she went up the rungs of the leadership all the way to the number one Toastmaster in Taiwan. I don't take credit. It's because I listened to my mentor who said, take the stories you already have and make them so good. Someone will pay to hear them. Mark, my coach, he said, your stories don't have to be sensational. They just have to be sincere. So you don't need Mount Everest stories. You just need some simple stories. A plunger in a bathroom made a point when I formulated it right. So consider this scenario. You're about to give the speech of your life. You are competing in the World Championship of Public Speaking. Not yet, Kevin, but in a couple weeks. Okay. So you walk into, it's Saturday morning. You walk into the meeting room. You look out and you see 2,000 chairs. Whoa. You can smell the coffee brewing in the back of the room. You can feel the tension in the air. It was exactly 9 a.m. The trumpet was about to sound the contest to begin, and my dad walks up to me and says, Darren, I can't find my seat. Not now! There's 2,000 seats. Pick one. Here I am yelling at the man who I love and cares about me the most. That's when I realized the tension wasn't out there. It was all right up here. So this is just, I'm going to show you just a super short clip. This is on YouTube if you want to check it out, but this is how it started. Contestant number five, Darren LaCroix. Ouch. Ouch. Darren LaCroix. It's an old video, yes. Interesting mustache. idea flashed into your head. It was perfect for you. And then all of a sudden, from the depths of your brain, another thought started forcing its way forward through the enthusiasm until finally it shouted, yeah, great idea, but what if you <laughs> fall on your face? What do you do when you fall on your face? Do you try and jump right up and hope no one noticed? Are you more concerned with what other people will think than what you can learn from it? <laughs> Mr. Contest Chair. <laughs> Friends! And the people way in the back! Ouch! <laughs> Did you feel I stayed down too long? <laughs> Have you ever stayed down too long? So that was the beginning. Um, how do you tell stories with impact? That's why we're here. If something touches you emotionally, chances are it could become a story. And I'm going to show you how to start building a story file. Uh, I told you what happened with that. That was just a moment, but it helped me illustrate a point. Um, so find them. So we're in the handout now. Find them. Find them. Where do you find stories? Where do you find stories? They're all around you. You just haven't looked for them. So I'll show you how to identify stories in everyday life and right under your nose. You just never look for them. So I was speaking in Europe. This is my coach, Mark Brown, and this is Alona. She was our event planner. She brought us into town. Notice something interesting about the car. It's parked on the sidewalk. Uh, and then I'm looking around this city in Europe, and all of a sudden, all of the cars are on the side. I'm like, we would get ticketed or towed in the United States for that. So took a picture because it struck me it captured me and then I'm at the event we're setting up and these are executives for a company called Luxoff a finance company in Europe huge company and these 
a lot of the people in front of me, they probably had 4,000 people working for them. And then all of a sudden they grab a fish bowl and they start collecting cell phones. I was like, are you out of your mind? If you did that here, someone would be shot. I couldn't believe, they were going, and they were given the cell phones, different culture, but I didn't believe it, so I took a picture. Uh, another thing that was striking, Alona, who did not speak English, by the way, we had a translator with us, uh, and Alona, she could, a couple words here and there, but I tell this story uh, the night before, and I tell, I'll tell it, the rest of it after, but um, Mark Brown, who was my coach, that you saw him, when I start telling the story, I said, if you don't know Mark Brown, he stands about six foot two, he's a native of Jamaica, and he's got this beautiful booming laugh like the guy from the old 7-Up commercial. Ah, ha, ha, ha. That was my coach. So I'm setting up the characters, and Alona, who doesn't speak English, starts laughing. She, she doesn't understand what I'm saying, but she starts laughing because she got the connection. And the next morning when we're setting up, here's what happened. <laughs> What do you what mean? What do I do with you? I right, want to hear. Oh. What do you want to hear? Alona Let's hear laugh. your laugh. No, I hear, hear Alona laugh. Let her laugh alone. Let Alona <laughs> laugh alone. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I love that. That is so awesome. Made my night wonderful. <laughs> 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 doesn't get any cuter than that, but we connect on emotion. Uh, Mark and I were flying back, we go through Germany, and we start talking about why I took the pictures, and well, could those be stories? And this is the napkin that I wrote down the ideas that Mark was spewing out, but if you wanna write it down, it's on your hand out there. Look for, look at your phone, look at the pictures. What amazed you, what amused you, what moved you, what amazed you, what amused you, and what moved you. What amazed you, what amused you, and what moved you. And then here's the key part. What's the lesson learned? What could the lesson be? Because for you and I, like Aesop has the fable, and there's the lesson learned. We tell stories for a purpose. One of my messages is capture what captures you. All those pictures I took. And I was like, what's the message here? So when I teach speakers and presenters, I teach them capture what captures you. Right now in your phone, go ahead, pull out your phone and just open up your camera roll. We'll go to break in just a couple minutes here. But open your camera roll while we're talking here. I'm encouraging you to take your phone out um, and just scroll through. With those questions in mind, what amazed you, what amused you, and what moved you? And on break, See if there's one picture that could maybe tell a story and have a, have a lesson there. So I encourage you to do that while we go on break. Um, I encourage you to start a story folder. Literally on your computer, have a folder. If you do one thing, if I can get you to just do this one thing, I promise you'll start getting ideas and filling it. I just need you to just make the folder, my story folder. And then I, I teach, I use a Word document, I'm kind of old school, but I use a Word document, I teach speakers to have a story file. When you just get an idea, write it down, throw it in there, throw it in, you don't have to develop it, but you gotta capture it, because then you realize strategically you might be able to use these in different places. The cool part is a good story you can use over and over again. Uh, there's a thing called Evernote that, one of, that Ed, my friend, uses. Uh, it's a free app that you can download, and for our younger viewers, there's this thing called Paper, I don't know if you've heard of it. Which one? Paper? Okay. Um, so all the ideas I start putting in there, start putting in there. You just do this, and I promise you, your trajectory will change. The trajectory code. Your trajectory will change. You'll start looking more for stories. You'll start seeing more stories. You know, it's just kind of like when you're going to buy a new car, and you have in your mind, I'm going to buy a new uh, black Lexus. I want a black Lexus. And you drive around town. What do you see everywhere? Black Lexus. They were there yesterday, but you hadn't told your subconscious mind to look for them. So what I'm trying to train you to do is start looking for stories. I promise it will enhance your life. Uh, here's some strategic reasons. Uh, maybe a story about your first day. Mistakes happen. So if you wanna take screenshot uh, pictures of these, please, please, please do. Um, 
Mistakes happen. That's a lesson that you, a story, find your story. Responsibility, quitting, resilience, change, lead, follow, inspiration, uh, being best matters. You are your brand. You bring, every, you bring you to everything. Best customer service, jerk customer, first time, learn something new. These are just some ideas. For your world, you may have some different ideas, but I just really want to get this going for you. Um, remember Shy Nicole? I was sitting in the back with her uh, on Monday. She was the one who didn't want to sing. She, didn't, she told her story. Um, when we were talking about it a little more after, I was really encouraging it because I could see she wanted to, but she didn't want to. She wanted to, so that's why I encouraged her. Um, but she, she was talking about not having a mentor and it hurt her. And that's why she wants to lift you up because she didn't have that. So they kind of formulated that idea for her, but that could be a powerful story if she wants to help someone and they just not ready for it. Why, why would you want to help me? That could be a great story for Nicole. Um, your audience wants to hear you, but they really want to know you. Here's the cool part about when you tell stories and when you tell them better, actually people are going to like you more and want to know you more because you're doing that. They don't have to be sensational, just sincere. Uh, so I'm going to cover this and we'll take a break. This is a short one, but fillet them. So first we have to find stories, then we've got to fillet them, meaning we've got to kind of cut them up and let go of the boring parts. Um, my original speech was 1,492 words. It's a seven-minute speech, so I had to get it down to 750. So I asked myself over and over, how do I say it better in fewer words? How do I say it better in fewer words? Have you heard people who are boring storytellers? <laughs> I love the face that you mean. Yep. <laughs> well, the problem is they just have too much filler. If you think about um, Alfred Hitchcock says, all Hollywood does is take real life and pull out the boring parts. They just get to the meaty parts. And people who are boring storytellers, they just don't get it. The more you tell a story, I encourage you, the more you tell a story, the shorter it will get. Why? Because whether, even if it's on the phone, something happens, there's a car accident on the way in, and you think it's a fascinating story. Call your friends. Tell your friends while you're driving. The more you tell it, the more you realize, well, when I say this, nobody reacts. When I say this, nobody reacts. When I say this, everybody reacts. So naturally, you'll get to see which are the compelling parts based on your audience, facial expression, what they say, what they hear. Um, the shorter your stories are, the more likable you are as a storyteller. So now we're going to get into the good stuff after break. Has this been helpful so far?